fun. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is our latest From the Ground Up interview series. In case you don't know me, my name is Carmen Milagro. I'm your host. I'm also a certified CBD uh, consultant. I am also the founder of Davina Skincare and Botanicals. I sing a little bit and I'm also an author about truths about hemp CBD, a guidebook for curious folks. So let's get right to it. You know, on this show, we are on a quest. We're on a quest to gather advice wisdom, uh, you know, nuggets of wisdom, life hacks, uh, business strategies, life strategies, health and wellness strategy, wellness strategies. I can't talk today for some reason. I think it's the excitement. And I'm really excited because my guest today is someone super, super special. He is one of our treasures here in the Bay Area and beyond. And let me just tell you a little bit about him. Uh, his name is Mr. Larry Batiste. Now, for those of you who don't know who Larry is, you soon will. Larry's career in the entertainment industry spans over 40 years. He's been a musical director for the Grammys, the Tech Awards for the last 27 years. That in itself is something. He's authored a book entitled The Art and Business of Songwriting, and it's coming out uh, on Oxford Uni uh, University Press. His recording career started in 1979, I believe. We'll double check that with him. He's recorded with or he's shared the stage with various multi-genre artists, including Whitney Houston, Michael Bolton, Carlos Santana, Natalie Cole, uh, Al Jarreau, Patty Austin, Huey Lewis and the News, Mickey Thomas, Pete Townsend, and the list goes on and on and on. He's also lent his voice to over 500 recordings and commercials, but that's only one side of the coin. Larry is also a tireless and relentless advocate for musicians' rights. He's dedicated to mentoring, and the professional development of youth and independent artists and champions a better life for music creators. He's a trustee, a lifetime member of the Recording Academy and is traveling to Europe. He's, we were just talking about that backstage in the green room, the virtual green room. He's getting ready to go on tour in Europe and you know, doing all kinds of other projects. In addition to, he's getting ready to record an album this coming fall. So, I'm just going to bring him on so that we can talk to him directly about all the things that he does. Hello, Larry. Welcome. Wow. That's some kind of introduction. Whew. <laughs> I was trying to get through it all. There's so much more. I know I had to sort of condense it, Larry, but thank you for being on the show. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for inviting me. And, and Carmen, you are quite a legend yourself. Oh. <laughs> Oh, sure. <laughs> Larry, let's um, you know this. This was sort of a recap of you know some of the things that you're doing mm -hmm. and some of the things that you're involved in. But where let let's go back in time. Let's go back to when you were growing up. When was the first time or the first event or that moment when you realized that music was it for you? You were all in on this business of music? Well, you know, when I first started, I wasn't thinking about business and music at all. I was just, I just kind of fell in love with music. And, and actually, you know, when I was about seven years old, um, we inherited a piano and um, I'm not a piano player, but my, my, I had an uncle that was in a, a he was a saxophone player and he had also owned a piano. But he was in bands like Count Basie, Duke Ellington, and people like that. And uh, sadly, he became an alcoholic, and he died in his alcoholism. And my auntie thought it was music was the evil thing. And when he passed away, she didn't want anything musical in the house. So she gave things away, and she gave us the piano. And no one really had an interest in the piano. But so this piano stayed in our garage for years. And then... Um, 
you know, I started messing around with the pianos and that's why my songwriting came about. You know, I took all the clothes and everything because it was like a, a, a coat rack. You know? right. <laughs> so no one was, so I started playing one note. I'm going, okay, oh, this other note sounds good with that. Next thing you know, it was a chord and this chord <laughs> sounds good with that chord. And so this, this music became my medicine. It was my best friend. So when I was a kid and I would, and things would happen to me, I would, you know, retreat to this garage to this piano, and I would kind of document my situation on the piano and write songs. So it was music has always been my best friend in that way. And um, and once I documented the situation, I was free to go back out in the world. And so music has always been my best friend. Right. And, and I began writing songs that way. And the the moment it became real to me is when I joined a group called Bill Summers and Summers Heat. And that's when we started making our first records that got on the charts and started touring and stuff. And when it really got real to me is when I was touring and, and I would see thousands of people singing the song that I'd written in my garage. Right. Wow. That's when I recognize the power and connection of music. Sure. You know, in all these different places. Yeah, and it's and it's beautiful that you turned that you turned it around where music was not the evil thing, but it was the healing thing for you. It was the healing thing. Right? Was the best friend. Yeah. I love that. I've never <laughs> heard someone say music is their best friend, which, you know, for so many people that really is true, but I've never heard it positioned that way before. I love that. Yeah, it's, it's so healing. And, you know, the thing is, and that's what I always try to return back to, you know, you know, during the course of time, you know, you realize that, oh, I got to do something for a living. So then you learn how to turn um, your music into a business. How can I get so good at something that someone will actually pay me for it? Right. You know, under these different services. And um, so, I, so I learned how to produce. I learned how to write. I learned how to arrange. I learned how to provide a service for people through music. So I went through all these things in my life of being signed to a publisher, to all this kind of stuff, to turn full circle to go, okay, this is not why I started music. And right. to turn back to the love of music. And that's why I always try to bring it back to doing music for the passion, the yeah. love, yeah, the course. healing, the all that good stuff. And um, so. But it, but it also, I think it's really important. Like you said, there's, there's a reason why there's all these, you know, motivational quotes, follow your bliss, follow your passion. But mm -hmm. until you realize or figure out a way to make a living at it, mm -hmm. you know, that's the, that I think is what a lot of times I, I champion this idea of, yes, we need to motivate people to follow their passions, but we also need to educate and get that learning, however that comes about. Yes, yes, yes. Being able to make a living at it so that you get to work in your passion. Therefore, you're always wanting to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah, you know, I have about people, I have about 15 jobs in the music business. So when people say, what do you do? And I go, well, what do you want me to do? Right. So, so another thing I used to tell kids, you know, how do you do so many things? Well, being broke can make you talented. Right. <laughs> So, you know, it's just Being broke will make you talented. There you go. I think that's a great quote. That's a great t shirt. It, it is. So, you know, you just learn how to do something really well to sure. where, okay, when I pay for this service, you know, well, I got to really know what I'm doing. So, you know, get good at something, you know, and, and then get good at something else. Yeah. And then get good at something else, you know, that, that kind of thing. Right. So, and, and and so I don't think I'm the greatest of anything sp specifically. You know, I, I just I would disagree with you, Larry. You know, well, you know, I just try to put it all together. You know, luckily, um, you know, when I went to school, I I was a trombone major in, in college, and um, I thought I was just going for trombone. But um, you know, part of being a music major is like learning all the other instruments too. So. I never got good at the other instruments, but you know, I had to take a semester of flute, a semester at violin and all the other things. And so I didn't realize it at the time, but it was preparing me for what I'm able to do now, which is be a musical director and understand and communicate with all musicians and right. know all the ranges or whatever. So 
Yeah. You know? And so I'm not really intimidated to stand in front of, of, of an orchestra because I know what the ranges are and I can write for violin and, ch and cello and all this kind of stuff. I could do the same for flute and tuba, baritone, all this kind of stuff. And so um, without knowing that, I was kind of getting prepared for kind of what I do and having a deep understanding of, of every all different genres of music and stuff. Right. That's, that's amazing. And when you, when you were younger, or even now, because I think, you know, you and I were talking earlier about always keep learning, right? That, mm -hmm. I feel like that's sort of like the secret sauce for anyone in any industry, in any industry is to keep yeah. learning your yeah. craft. Yeah. Do you still, I know you do a lot of mentoring, and I know that you coach and that you are there for, you know, so many different people, myself included. Um, but what about for you? Are you, when you were younger, did you have mentors? Did you have people guiding you? Oh my God. You? Yeah, I think, and that's why I still mentor today. You know, each of the, um, the Recording Academy, which I'm really involved with for yeah. many, many years, they have a, a mentorship program. And each semester I take on a new student. And, and, and so I have a lot of um, nieces and nephews because you know, although it's supposed to be a semester, I never let them go. Exactly. You know, and so I just had, I just did the tech awards for NAM, and I had my latest mentor, a mentee, shadow me, you know, the, during the whole experience. And it was just great yeah. really for both of us. But I definitely had mentors, and I think that's why it's instilled in me to give back because I know that, you know, when in high school, you know, I had my my musician mentor, which was a guy named Bill Bell, who he mentored a lot of people in the Bay Area, a lot of people that went on to become big, big time musicians and stuff. And then vocally, I had a guy named Phil Reeder, who in high school, we had the Castellers and, and what a great experience to travel to Europe, you know, as a 12th grader and get that experience. Right. You know, those kind of experiences let me know that this was really real. You know, I believe that I could be successful because my teacher told me I could. Right. Bill Bell said to to myself and my business partner, uh, we started our publishing company, Clay Tobin Reason, and yeah. I was 12th grade. Yep. Uh, That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> That's entrepreneurship <laughs> artist. Come you on. know, when well, we did research, you know, in the 12th grade, you're under a lot of pressure. So, okay, what are you going to do next? Where are you going to go to school? What are you going to do? Blah, blah, blah. So we knew we wanted to do music and we had to figure out, okay, who's really making money in the music business? And we realized we used to see um, uh, musicians that were awesome, but they were starving. And right. so, so who's really making money in the business? So we realized it was the the producers, the songwriters, publishers, and record labels and people like that so we need to start a um we need to start a publishing company and write our own songs and so we realized that in the 12th grade so we had a lot of mentors that way and i'll get to that in a second but my musical mentors were phil bell and um and phil reader and i remember one day bill bell said to clay Tolman and i he says you guys have a suit and he said yes okay i want you to show up at such and such a place at such and such a time and we, we showed up there and with our instruments and it was Billy Eckstein. So, and then the next time it was Eartha Kitt. And then the next time it was, you know, it was people like that. Yeah. And, and so, and those kind of experiences let us know that this was really real and we could, we could be in this business. And I thought, you know, I look back now, I'm going, what a chance that teacher took on us kids that we were going to really show up and do a good job and make him look and not make him lose his job. Right. And what a chance he took on us and what um, great mentorship to put us in real professional situations. And um, and so I try to do the same with yeah. people that, you know, that have the same thing with the field reader and traveling to Europe with the vocal thing. And then when we, in the 12th grade, when we decided to start our publishing company, we said, well, we need to know something about this business. How do we learn about that? Well, we need to find an attorney. And we found this guy named Jeffrey Graubart. He had an office in Gear Jelly Square. And uh, this guy handled the fairs of, this is the 70s. So the high groups in the Bay Area at that time was Journey, Janis Joplin, Santana, 
And so we went for him. We were in the 12th grade. So we called and we go, we made an appointment and uh, we had saved up $125. We got, that was a lot of money for us. Sure. Uh, so we made our appointment, we walked in. He thought we were adults. We walked in, we were 12th graders with suits and briefcase, empty brief, briefcase. <laughs> So he chuckled. He thought we were cute and all that stuff. Right. So he canceled all his appointments that day. And he started from square one about publishing and copyrights and all these things. So he was our business mentor. And then he took us to lunch. And then he came back in the afternoon and, you know, told us what we should look for in contracts and all that kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, I said, well, Mr. Grabart, we really appreciate you. Uh, how much do we owe you? And he goes, no, 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 that's okay. I said, no, no, the 125 was burning my pocket. We was ready to give it to him. And, uh, and I said, no, he says, are you sure? And, and I said, yeah, we're ready to pay you. And he says, okay, $375 an hour times seven. <laughs> <laughs> so naturally we had to back down and go, okay. <laughs> so anyway, he gave us that. And so for about a year, you know, he checked on us once a month and he says, okay, what are you working on now? Okay, let me see that contract. That's whatever. And so through that process, he mentored us in terms of business. And so I kind of do the same thing with other people. You know, let me see that contract and that kind of thing. And so this kind of instilled in me, the I had mentors and I also mentor other people. And I keep that going. Because exactly. you start from somewhere. You don't, you're not born knowing this stuff. <laughs> You know, that's it's one of those things, right? You know, you pay it forward. We were talking about you said earlier, you know, you you were talking to your children about their your network or yes. calling someone and and sometimes it's it really is about who you know. Absolutely. That person who's offered to help you or offered to connect you, why not take them up on that? There's Absolutely. If you surround yourself in a circle of good people, good things will happen, right? You just kind of go, you know, you're, you're, and I, I tell the kids, and I was telling you earlier, your network is your net worth, right? And so, you know, you're not meeting people for that purpose, but so you're just trying to be in good company. Right. And so, good relationships. And good relationships. Yeah. And so people who are like-minded, people who think they have the same philosophies and things like that. You know, one of my dear friends is a guy named Andre Pessis, a songwriter who I met at West Coast Songwriters about maybe 30 years ago. And I was kind of new there and lunchtime came and I didn't know anybody. And there was this guy sitting down by himself. And so it would empty place seat right next to him. So I sat down and we started talking and we had the same type of humor and the same type of whatever. I wrote mostly R&B type songs and and he's a country writer. You know, he wrote for, uh, oh, Waylon Jennings. And, you know, he writes for Bonnie Raitt and those kind of people. And he's had a lot of hits with uh, Huey Lewis and people like that. Right. And so um, we started writing together. And it's been really a great relationship just based on me liking him and, right. you know, and that kind of thing. And he liking me. And the same thing with my uh, musical directing career. I, being a musical director never entered my mind until I met this guy named Halil Resner. Uh -huh. One day we were both in the Grammy board and um, and we were sitting there and I was going, well, you know, when I first joined the Recording Academy, it's been 40 plus years now. But when I first got there, I would go to events and I never saw people that look like, like me. It was mainly rock events or some type of event like that. And so I'm going, well, why don't we do something for the R&B community and um, that genre of music. And I thought, um, well, publishing and copyrights is information that that's a thread that runs through all genres of music. So at the, my next board meeting, I said, hey, how about we do something for the R&B community and let's make it about publishing and you know uh, copyrights and things like that. And the room went silent. <laughs> so, and only one person said, uh, said Hey, I think that's a good idea. And it was Halel Resner. Halel Resner, you know, he's he co-founded a magazine called Mix Magazine. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the Bible for engineers and, wow. and technology. 
and stuff. And uh, so, um, so he says, well, I'll produce the event with you. We did the event. It was really successful. And that was in the 80s. And the popular groups around that time was Tony, 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 in Vogue and people like that. Sure. So we had kind of like a contest. And they were the judges. And, and we had food. And we had all this great stuff. And it right. went so well that on the next day, he says, hey, look, I do this show called the Tech Awards. I never heard of it. And he oh, says, I uh, I, how, how would you like to be musical director? Now, Hillel didn't know anything about my music. He never heard my songs. He never heard me perform. He never, he never know. Oh, we just sat on this board together and we saw each other in meetings. Right. So that's that's a network. He right. really liked working with me. I like working with him. Mm -hmm. He offered me a job without even knowing. So I go to lunch with him the next day and he has me a script. I'm going, there's a script? And I open it up and it's like, okay. Then um, Phil Spector comes out. Then David Letterman comes out. Then Bob, I'm going, what? These people are going to be there? <laughs> so, so I realized this was a real serious job right. that I had gotten just based on me knowing this person and him liking me. And it's that, again, the power of building that relationship. Yeah, yeah. And so it, as a result, of course, I wanted to come through for him. And I did. So it's been 27 years now. And I got Whole bunch of stories in between, but you know, it's, it's magical. But I never thought I'd be about being a musical director until that moment, right. and, and now that led into the Grammys and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, right. and I love. Thank you so much for sharing this because what I love about that is not only is it are you you know really showcasing the power of building relationships, but also having faith. Now, faith, mm -hmm. right? Is it's wonderful when someone else has faith in you. And yes. they'll see this for you. But it's also about, I believe, it's also about having that faith in yourself. Yeah. To yeah. take that job, to take yeah. that offer. And maybe you don't know exactly how to do it, but you learn. Yeah. Yeah. You go on that faith that you can learn to do it. You can yeah. figure it out. Yeah. I think that's part of the reason sometimes where people do get stuck is because they aren't able to take those leaps of faith in you have to yourself. take the leap and you know if, if you know you've done the work you know it's more than just thinking you have talent it's so much it's having the talent but it's also realizing that uh what i've learned to realize is that it's, it's a people business you know it's an 80 percent of, of those jobs are logistics dealing with people i mean 20 percent is really the music of course the music has to be good, but it's taken right. for granted that you're really good. Right. The, the fact that you have talent is kind of taken for granted. You know, the um, the real gig is being able to deal with people and create win-win situations. Right. You, and know, yeah. it, it, you, know, you know, when you, you know, hire in a band, you know, deal yeah. with all the logistics, you know, you're a band leader, <laughs> you know, what's the load in, what's the back line, what's all this kind of stuff, what are the songs, what are the keys, what are the, you right. know, the personalities, you know, you do yep. shows like Grammys, and of course the 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 Grammy producers, they think they they're concerned with, you know, big is it moving, is it action packed yeah. or whatever, you know, and the uh, the manager wants to promote the latest single, the new single coming out, and the artist wants to do the latest song they just wrote because right. that's what they're most excited about. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, trying to create the you know doing some research and finding out and coming up with something that that's a win-win for everybody. So that's a lot of the gig, you know? Yeah, right. It, it, absolutely. It's, it's the details. It's the showing up on time. It's the being professional. Yeah. Yeah. It's having the ability to, to deal with some of the drama. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. <laughs> you, know. you know that. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. But you know what? At the end of the day, People want to feel good about what they did and who they did it with. Exactly. Yeah, this is this is amazing, Larry. This is yeah. so, so wonderful. Thank you. I I also wanted to just sort of kind of on this topic of mentorship and all of that. But what would you say that? What would you advise if you were able to just drill everything down? What we've been talking about and everything else that you know. If you could share three top 
life business musician hacks, you know, like what would you, you're talking, let's say you're talking to a group of emerging artists and what would you say, hey, I, I've only got two minutes and I'm going to give you three tips. What would they do? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I would say, well, first of all, uh, be honest. Be honest about your talents and where you are. You know, um, you know, and, and before, even in my book that's, I'm, that, that I've just written, I talk about doing a self-evaluation. Who am I really? You know, what are my passions? Yeah. What I, you know, what, right. what, 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 what do I wake up for every morning? You no, know, what's my yeah, what's my personality? Am I shy? Am I outgoing? Do I like to dress up? Do I like to wear the same jeans every day? You know, just really kind of knowing yourself you know, and um, so it's like being honest about your skill set and um, doing proper research of what this job actually entails. You know, oh, I want to be an engineer. Okay, that's great. That sounds sexy. But, you know, engineer, first of all, you got to go have all the skills. But the other part of showing up before everybody, being the last person to leave, yeah. some of the music is great, but some of it sucks. Do you really, you know, and so it's like, it's reality. So I say number one is like really being honest about your talent, your skills, and and what do I need to work on and and that kind of thing. And then the other thing is all the things that your mother taught you. You know that is like being on time. You know being polite. You know all those type of things. You know it's just really important and um, and make sure that you are some the some a company that someone wants to be in. Right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And, Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important because I say the same thing almost verbatim. Yeah. You know, when I'm working with young people, because at the end of the day, your talent, yes, it of course it's important. But if you're awful to work with, if you're delaying productions because you're never on time, there's a hundred other talented exactly. musicians exactly. that exactly. are hungry that are pounding at the door for that spot. Yeah. And I would say, thirdly, um, be an asset to the situation and learn everybody else's job. So you're the singer and you're coming in um, to do background vocals on the record, but also have an idea of what the producer's job is, what the engineer's job is, whatever. So you're you're bringing something to the situation that's lifting it up, you know. And so, like, if you're singing, there's little things like, OK, after you finish singing, don't start talking because then the engineer's got to spend time cleaning that up after you're gone. And, you know, those little things that make you really a joy, you know, to work with. Um, That's wonderful. And do you, your book, you know, I'd love to sort of dive into that a little bit, the art and business of songwriting. I, I love this title, by the way, because that's how I've always seen that. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but how, how, what inspired you? What, how, what, who, or what prompted you to write this <laughs> specific book? Yeah, well, it's a kind of a long story. I'll try to shorten it a little bit. I, um, I was, I have a really good friend named John Bendick, and John Bendick is, um, you know, a great musician. We used to write songs together, and he said to me one day, you should write a book. I said, you should write a book about songwriting. And I said, why? Why would somebody want to read my book? There's so many books out there already. And, so, and songwriting is not rocket science. And he said, well, why don't you teach? And then teach, teaching would, then you would be in touch with kids and be relevant and find out all the things that, you know, people are, you know, stuttering on right now, you know, that kind of thing. So I said, okay, you know, I, was, I really wasn't interested in teaching. You know, because I've never, I've, I've always been an entrepreneur. I've never actually had a nine to five job or any type of job like that. So anyway, the very next day, the head of San Francisco State uh, Music Department called me and said, introduced herself. And she says, hey, I, I hear you're interested in teaching. Now I've forgotten about my conversation with John. So I go, I am? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so she said, well, John Bendick told me that. I'm going, oh, my God. He actually called this lady. So. You know, in order to save face and not make him look ridiculous, I said, oh, yeah, 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 I'm interested in teaching. She says, well, look, uh, why don't we make an appointment and you, you know, tell me when, let's talk. So I said, okay. And then I got nervous. I'm going, well, I've never had a resume. I never, you know, so I worked on a resume. And I'm going to think about what I've done and right. all this stuff. So I go there and I canter my 
resume. She says, what is this? I said, well, this is my resume. She says, well, I've already Googled you. Just tell me what you want to teach and when you want to start. And I said, off the top of my head, I said, well, how about the art and business of songwriting? That just came to me. Right. And then um, she says, okay, write a curriculum and tell me when you want to start. <laughs> so that's where the title came from. Right. And so I wrote a curriculum for the art and business song and they said, you only have to teach one day a week. So I mm -hmm. said, okay, good. And for you know, 90 minutes. So I, I can handle that. <laughs> so anyways, that's how I started. So I, I taught that for a couple of years and yeah. then a friend of mine uh, knew this publisher and it happened to be Oxford University Press. Right. And they told him that they didn't have that title in their catalog. Right. And they contacted me and said, why don't you write a couple sample chapters? Uh -huh. And I did. Right. And they signed me to a, a publishing deal. That's amazing. Now, I, and that part, I, that part of the story, I didn't know. But I don't know if you recall the first time that I ever met you mm -hmm. was through our mutual friend Patty Carlisi. Yes, yes. And at that time, that was ooh, two thousand four ish. I can't remember when you started, but I worked at San Francisco State in yes. the <laughs> department. Yes. The music. Patty Carlisi is awesome. So that's how long we've known each other. Is yes. that just, and it was so interesting because I was so excited that, that that was going to start. It wasn't part of the curriculum when I first started there. Mm -hmm. you know, so I was in the multimedia studies program as well as a, a digital video intensive. And yeah. I was for the director of those programs. So yeah, it was it's where you know this is this is another reason, right? Why when you are in whatever industry, but we're talking about the music industry today. Yeah. You never know when you're going to cross paths with people. Yeah, you can. If you if you're connected with people who are doing good, no matter what they're doing, it's a good thing. It is. It is. It always comes full circle. I love this because here we are, way back when, yes. indirectly tied, and now we're doing our interviews together. And I just love this so. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, you know, I know that you're really busy and I really appreciate you taking this time. Usually at the end of the interview part, what mm -hmm. I like to do is sort of what I call the rapid fire questions. Okay. Um, so I'll choose a few questions and it's, it's something that you just, whatever comes to the top of your head, you know, immediate okay. answer. And if, and if it's something that you don't want to answer, you just say pass. That's not well, right. If, if I would have known this, I would have had my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next time we'll, we'll start with coffee. Um, let's see. What brings you the greatest joy? Um, peace. Peace brings me to see my family happy. That's that's everything. My kids, my that's 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 everything. Just no activity, just everybody laughing in the same room. I'm good. Good, good, good. Um, who would you say is your greatest inspiration in life, business, music, or or all of the above? Oh my God! What person besides God? Right? Um, who? is my greatest inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, I would go first to my, my parents, you know, my father, who was just a great man and um, just so selfless and caring and taking care of everybody and, and gracious, humble. And I think that that's that's like I, you. <laughs> I get a lot of my spirit from him. Yes, you do. That's and, what uh, just taking care of folks and not even mentioning yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> You're carrying on the legacy. Yes, that's, that's, absolutely. That's you know? wonderful, Larry. Oh. Um, okay, how about this one? What would you say is your superpower? Um, I think my um, superpower is... Um, uh, being a giver, that's a superpower. It, 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 it listening is a superpower. It's and, and learning, you know, because I think listening is everything. Because 
you don't if you know everything then you have nowhere to go once you reach the top there's no place to go but down you got you have to keep evolving keep listening keep learning yeah. you know that's everything yeah I, I learned from my kids i learned from my mentees i learned from everybody and go oh really show me how you do that yeah. <laughs> so. i love that and i'm going to add one knowing i think one of your superpowers is your ability to spread so much joy and positivity in our community. Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think so. That's what others, that's what others to say. <laughs> I think a lot of people would agree with me because you do. I mean, just I think anyone who meets you and knows you, they only spend, they only need to spend a few moments with you and you just radiate this. This Thank the you. power of positivity and kindness and caring and giving and listening and I just you know I think if we could just bottle that up, Larry. Yeah, you <laughs> know, <it> there's just so <laughs> much going on in the world and there's so much uh, in the media and there's so much in the news that we all know about. So I, you know, especially on my social media, I try not to re-emphasize all that kind of stuff. If I could, if someone shares with me something that's that could be passed on that might help someone else. That's what I share, <laughs> you know? You, I, you do every single day. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, one more question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, what, if anything, would you change or would you change anything about your life? No, <laughs> I, I wouldn't change anything. It's just like, you know, a lot of times I didn't know where what's the right path to go, but I just try to um, ask for the right decisions, try to make the right, just based on the right things in terms of what felt good, right. you know, about what felt right, you know, that type of thing. And um, so I don't know, I, I, um, I it would be scary if I would have known what path to take or whatever. I just went by feel my whole life and, I'm, and hopefully the best is yet to come. Right. <laughs> it is, Larry. It is. I, I, you know, I'm still, you know, looking for that, looking for anything that's great, you know, and try to surround um, my, keep my circle of people a good circle yeah. and, um, you know, and, and keep working. And just, I just thank God that I'm able to be working, to be doing this long. And, um, you know, it's just all great. It's lovely. Yeah. Oh, it's just, I just love talking to you. One more question. Um, if you were able to, if you were able to have a conversation with 12 year old Larry, mm -hmm. you know, not 12th grade, not, not, but 12 year old Larry, mm -hmm. and you were able to go back, what advice would you give yourself at 12? I would say, don't be so shy. I was a very shy person, and I had to learn. Um, I had to learn how to be Larry. Really, I never would have guessed that. <laughs> I had to learn how. I had to learn as a as a learned behavior. You know, I was totally happy with showing up and having to experience myself and walking out the room. So I would some wonderful thing would be going on, and I would show up, sit in the back, and take it all in, and then walk away. And then after years and years of doing that, I realized I wasn't really doing anything. I wasn't creating a network. I wasn't getting to know anybody. I wasn't, you know, I was just, you know, going back into my cave, you know, and, and retreating. And so, like, um, you know, I had to learn how to, you know, step up to people and say, hey, I'm Larry Batiste. What are you doing? You know, with right. this kind of thing. Yeah, so, um, and that's when I started to grow. That's and so I, I would say the 12-year-old Larry, I say, it's okay, you're okay. You know, you're okay, you are enough. Oh, I love that, that's perfect. <laughs> you are enough, everybody's trying to do the same thing you're trying to do and find their way. Maybe you could help each other. Exactly, oh, yeah. those are the best words I've heard all day. Thank you so much, Larry. I, I just can't tell you how much I appreciate this. I appreciate every time we have a conversation. Absolutely. Um, you're just incredible. And um, the longevity that you've had in this career, you know, in this business with yeah. your career is, is really something. I think that's another book.
<laughs> it might be, but you know, but you say incredible. I said, thank you, the same thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. About being a good company. You know, well, well, I'm incredible. Uh -huh. I think it all, I, you know, I, I think you're cloned. You're in so many places. <laughs> Only, right? <laughs> Who's this over there? Is she really here? <laughs> You're so funny. Thank you so much, Larry. Oh, before, we, before we, you know, before I let you go, mm -hmm. um, two things. How, if if someone's wanting to to connect with you, um, would you be willing to share your social media or your whatever you, however they can connect with you? And then, what would your final words? What what's the final? Larryism that you would like to leave everyone with today. Oh my good. Oh my goodness. Um well first of all contacting me is pretty easy. Although I have Instagram, um, Twitter and Facebook. I'm mainly on Facebook. I just don't have time to right. it's, it's a full time job. It when, is. When the book comes out I'll be more on Instagram. But right now you can find me on Facebook if you I really want me to respond. <laughs> and yeah. then, um, then my uh, then my email address is L Baptiste at packbell.net. That's L like Larry, B A T I S like Sam, T E at packbell, P A C B E L L dot net. That's old school. I don't change. Yeah. I have the same field box I had, you know, 40 years ago. I don't do a lot of changing because people owe me money. I don't want to, you know, no confusion. <laughs> no confusion about you couldn't contact me. So all my stuff is all the same. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old royalties. Come on, you can pay. That's right, that's right. <laughs> that's that's a that's a business strategy, isn't it? Oh man. So Larry is um, um be yourself, be happy, have fun, enjoy life and enjoy others, you know, just have a good time. Oh, that's beautiful. That's a wonderful way to end this segment. Thank you again, Larry. Please tell give Linda a big hug for me. I, I can't wait to see you again. I know it's been a minute since we, you know, we're at, at we were at New Delhi restaurant with Chef Ron. Yeah. Oh, that was awesome. It'll happen. It'll happen. We're working on that. So absolutely more to come. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Larry, for your time, for your wisdom, for just your everything. Thank you. Thank you. And that is a wrap up for today's segment. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that you were able to at least get one or two different viewpoints, you know, every time that you tune in. And today's segment really echoes so much of what we've talked about with other fabulous, incredible, kind and generous people that have gone, you know, come on the show. This is the place where I'm trying to collect these stories and collect these nuggets of wisdom and these life hacks. You know, there's so many similarities that we all share. We all want to be happy. We all want to be creative and successful. And we're learning how different people do this. So once again, thank you to Larry Batiste for spending his his time with us today. Uh, you know, some of the some of the things that we talked about, I think, are transferable so easily into any industry that you're talking about. And hopefully you've learned a few things, you feel good about yourself, and you'll tune in next time. You know, as I've said before, transformational success starts from the ground up and from the inside out. And that's what we're trying to do here every time. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. We will have Larry's information and how to get a hold of him in the posts when we are you know, below or above, wherever it is. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, this has just been, I think, one of my favorite interviews. The musical director, he's a phenomenal human being, Mr. Larry Batiste, and just it's just one of the good ones. I'm just honored to know him. And until next time, I wish you all a healthy and happy, thriving life. I'm Carmen Milagro, and this is From the Ground Up. Thank you all. Bye-bye.